Okay, so thank you so much again to our presentation to our presenters for the Food of the Future segment. We are now going to jump right into our segment on ocean bioextractives. Our moderator for this section is Ms. Paige Bastian, who is Project Administrator in the Strategic Development and Initiatives Division. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to you, Paige. Hi, thank you, Sue. Good morning, everyone. I'd like to welcome you again to the second session of our Blue Economy Think Tank, Ocean Bioextractives. In this theme, we'll be diving deep into the possibilities that exist within tapping into our ocean biodiversity and the possibilities that can be created within the Bohemian economy and beyond. I'd like to remind our audience to use the question and answer box at the bottom of your screen to to question our panelists. And I'd like to now introduce them. First, we have Dr. Kirk Douglas, the director at the Center for Biosecurity Studies at the University of the West Indies. Mr. Rupert Hayward, co-founder and president at the Blue Action Lab here in the Bahamas. And Ms. Nikita Shiel Rule, founder and CEO of the Cat Island Conservation Institute. We're excited to hear your presentation topics from your respective personal areas. I'd like to welcome you to begin first, Dr. Kirk. Are you ready? Uh, yes, I am, Paige. Okay, you can go ahead and share your screen. Thank you. Thank you, and good morning to all the viewers and attendees at this event. Can everyone see my screen? Yes, we can. Can everyone see the screen? Yes, we can, Dr. Yes. Okay. Well, first, I would like to also thank um, Dr. Michelle Singh from CARDI, who put me into contact with the Bahamas Development Bank um, for this opportunity. So thanks to Dr. Singh and CARDI for that. Uh, what I will be looking at today is the blue economy and um, the potential that exists with respect to bioextractives from the blue economy. And there are many uh, ideas of what the blue economy consists of, um, whether it be tourism, mineral extraction, um, living resources or marine construction, but what we'll be focusing on is the actual living resources. Uh, there are a number of challenges that present themselves for the Caribbean, um, be it climate change, biodiversity decline, solid and liquid waste management, um, the lack of jobs, uh, the dependency on fossil fuels as well, and also the intellectual that your brain drain that occurs throughout the Caribbean. And so this is an idea of what possibilities exist with respect to the blue economy um, with bioextractives. Bio you have bioprospecting, which can be done um, leveraging the biodiversity that is present in the, mar the, the maritime environment. Uh, these could be coral, sponges, grasses, any marine fauna or flora and you can extract different bioactive compounds from them and use or utilize them in several um, industries. One of the major ones would be biopharma, which is estimated in terms of worth of 329 billion US dollars. Or you can have your fisheries waste. You can also utilize those as well. Um, the conk industry waste as well as we would have seen some previous presentations. And I will go through uh, two different examples within the conch industry that I think there exist some possibilities that you can, um, especially in the cosmeceutical industry, which is estimated at 52 billion US dollars. And then there's also the knowledge economy, something that isn't fully appreciated, I think, within the region um, with respect to intellectual property and also marine data that can be used as um, a commodity um, within the world. So this is one example of um, one extractive that is currently being used in the US um, and also in, in Southeast Asia as well. And this is crab blood. And those who are familiar with either mollusk or crustaceans would know that the blood from these animals are characteristically blue rather than red um, because of the, the um, the compound that is used within the hemolymph in these animals to carry to carry oxygen around the tissues. And these blood cells, the amoebocytes, have been targeted for uh, the use or application in a particular product called um, limitless amoebocyte lysate. 
And what these are are essentially the blood cells of the crab. And this is an, a photo of the horseshoe crab um, in America. Um, there's a huge vibrant industry, uh, almost $2 billion worth in terms of um, this industry. And it is utilized in uh, biopharma and all medical devices, vaccines, and drugs, they have to undergo a series of tests, even during production. So aside from the regulatory um, approval, you also have for every batch of device or vaccines, they have to undergo what you call a quality assurance test. And one of those critical quality assurance tests is this particular assay. And this particular product is rather expensive. One of these valves is estimate, uh, well, it's worth about 100 US dollars for just one of those valves. Um, so this is potential that exists um, as a waste product from the, the um, fisheries industry. So now we come to the different economic products that can be derived from the different fisheries waste. And I think this is a good opportunity also for Bahamas to uh, partner with CARDI on this particular initiative, um, where you will have a number of established fisheries processing uh, companies. And you can derive a number of different products from bioplastics to cosmetics, to animal feed, which was mentioned earlier, nutraceuticals, also biofuels, and interestingly, fish leather, where the skin of the fish can be converted into leather and into um, a number of different products. So at the CBS, we are currently launching our Waste Not Want Not initiative. And what this initiative seeks to do is to bring together the bioeconomy, which is really looking at your biodiversity and leveraging the intrinsic economic value that exists. And in this particular graphic, you can just focus here on the maritime biodiversity and what you can possibly do in terms of using carbon dioxide, which in the climate change conversation is a huge, huge issue. And climate mitigation strategies employed by, by the different Caribbean countries are going to be increasingly more um, important. And one strategy that you can do is you can trap your carbon dioxide that is produced from all the different industrial um, industries that you have within your country and leverage that carbon dioxide to be used as a green solvent um, to do the extraction, as I would have mentioned from the bio, uh, the, the fauna and flora uh, present in the maritime environment. And so then we come to what are the, the, the next steps? What are the solutions? I think the first that we'd have to do, or Bahamas should do, is to try to quantify that waste stream within the fisheries industry, because you will have a number of ideas of what you can do, but what you need to also appreciate is what do you currently have? What is the uh, volume of waste that you are currently producing from all of the different industries that are present within the, the, um, the Bahamas Islands? And then secondly, you also have to look at your maritime biodiversity. What do you currently have in your mar maritime um, environment? You know, what type of species? Do you know the full extent of the diversity and richness that you can you, you have present within uh, the Bahamas? Because this, again, it, it adds to the knowledge economy because you can also leverage this data to also attract investors and to also generate um, new um, investor opportunities as well. Then also feasibility studies. Once you have those in check, you can then develop uh, feasibility studies to see which of the current options or solutions that are on the table are the most feasible. And then look forward to then financing those uh, particular shortlisted solutions and um, implement the project and also continue to monitor and evaluate those particular initiatives. And I want to also highlight this particular issue. This is a, a project that is actually launched here in Barbados because we are also taking the blue economy very, very, very seriously. And uh, this is a project called the Blue Bot, blue Bot Project. And what this um, entails is the use of underwater robotics where you employ the use of an underwater robot to actually survey the maritime environment this would be reefs or even the, 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 the ocean 
and you can then develop data and timestamp and GIS um, stamp data that you can then use to monitor your maritime environment. Why is this important? Because when you have to introduce a number of different initiatives or interventions, then you can also monitor the, the extent of the success of those interventions. And not only is this project involving robotics, but it's also interestingly utilizing artificial intelligence. So all the data collected by the, the robot that is affixed with a camera, you can then render this data through an artificial intelligence algorithm and also do the analysis, which is very, very critical. And um, I think this is going to be growingly important for the rest of the Caribbean. And so I want to thank uh, Dr. Michelle Singh and Cardi, and also the Bahamas Development Bank for inviting the Center for Biosecurity Studies to this wonderful initiative. And I thank you very much. Uh, these are the references. Should you be interested? This is our center. Um, we are part of the University of the West Indies, KFL campus. This is our contact information. This is our website. And yes, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Douglas. That was very informative. We'd like to move on to our second presenter, Mr. Rupert Hayward. Are you ready? I, I am ready. I'm going to have to admit, I'm afraid I don't have a wonderful presentation like many of the other panelists today, but I do have a placeholder, which I will put up on the screen now, and then I will do the rest from, from memory. Can you, all, can you all see that appropriately? Yes, we can. Good. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, it is still morning, and thank you very much to the Bahamas Development Bank for allowing me to speak today about the Blue Action Lab. Um, for those who don't know me, I always start by saying I speak with a British accent, but I am actually a third generation Bahamian born and raised in Nassau. Uh, my family actually have been uh, in Grand Bahama since 1957, um, uh, running the free trade zone uh, in, 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 in Grand Bahama, the Freeport free trade zone. Um, I have a, a career in banking 10 years um, away from the Bahamas, and then I did an MBA in sustainable business management. Uh, Presidio Graduate School on the west coast of America and then I came home in 2015 with my family and you know looking very much at building sustainable value propositions for the island of Grand Bahama and the conversation changed quite quickly from an economic one to an existential one on the back of uh, two very large storms Matthew which we all know about in 2016 and then Dorian in 2019 uh, which covered about two-thirds of our island with water and you know when we woke up on the 2nd of September um, the conversation around how we grow a sustainable equitable uh, and resilient island um, became front and center and we we set about thinking about how we can take the embedded benefits of operating inside the free trade zone the 230 square mile free trade zone in Grand Bahama uh, to to accelerate the technologies that are required to create um, an equitable, sustainable, resilient future for the Bahamas, for Grand Bahama, but also for the billion other people around the world who are suffering in the face of climate change with the rising seas and larger storms. So we're looking really to, to leverage the, uh, the benefits of operating inside a free trade zone with streamlined regulations, uh, streamlined licensing processes, uh, we have about $10 billion in real terms in today's money of infrastructure invested in the ground here. Much of that is underutilized, but it includes a very sophisticated maritime sector, which, as I'm sure we all know, is an important uh, market and advisor and an and entity for a legitimate blue economy. Um, so we have, for those who don't know, one of the deepest harbors south of Nova Scotia uh, up until 2018, I think, uh, before we got hit by um, a large hurricane in 2019, we actually had the largest dry dock or ship repair yard in the world by volume. We have one of the largest container terminals in the Western Hemisphere uh, and other very sophisticated maritime players such as the cruise lines uh, who also operate here in the free trade zone. When you start to build on top of that the underutilized infrastructure, so we have 75,000 acres of, of undeveloped pristine coastal 
environments, which includes a, a very extensive canal network uh, with, with available land at affordable prices. Um, and then you build on top of that the, uh, the undeniable access to our natural environment that we have throughout the Bahamas. Uh, and here in Grand Bahama, we have reefs on our south shore, we have ma mangroves in our north shore, uh, we have deep water drop-offs a mile off our south shore, uh, and, and many other uh, marine ecosystems that are essential for building a sustainable blue and green economy. So with that in mind, we formed the Blue Action Lab, which is essentially a, an onboarding business, which is allowing these technologies and entrepreneurs to come down, relocate in the Bahamas, both Bahamians and also from abroad, tapping into you know, this, this globally emerging market. And to put that into context, there's about $23 trillion that is uh, forecast to be invested worldwide into the resiliency sector to help nations and communities cope with the effects of climate change over the course of the next two decades. Six trillion, it's not billions, it's trillion dollars of that is earmarked for Latin America and the Caribbean. So it's a huge opportunity for us. And I think we're uniquely positioned here in Grand Bahama uh, with the Blue Action Lab to accelerate these technologies. Um, and by doing so, creating a sustainable and resilient future, but also creating this blue and green economy that is desperately needed um, certainly in the face of a pandemic, which has gutted one of our major industries in tourism. So it's, it's a way of diversifying our economy, creating jobs, creating this equitable and inclusive opportunities for Bahamians, and creating a model really that can be transported around the world. So just to give you an idea of the action areas that we're focused on, many of which have been touched today, uh, touched on today, you know, ocean innovation, uh, underwater robotics and monitoring is, is hugely important for us. The restoration economy, you know, sadly, when we look at our reefs um, today in the Caribbean, about 80% of our reefs have died, 50% have died worldwide, 90% of the world's reefs are forecast to die within the next uh, by 2050. And reefs, as we all know, uh, are the number one protection against storm surge. They take out 97% of the wave's kinetic energy, 25% of all marine life is contained in our reefs. So they're extremely important parts of our infrastructure. They are dying. Uh, they will continue to die unless we do something about it. And so the restoration economy, I think, is a huge opportunity for Bahamians to be involved in. And I'll come on to talk about some of the businesses that we already have operating here in the Bahamas that are central to that restoration economy. Sustainable infrastructure, you know, nature-based solutions, um, you know, whether it is living seawalls uh, with, with, with mangroves um, on the seafronts to dissipate wave energy, create new habitats for, for marine life, or even planting corals on large scale groins and other forms of, of uh, resilient infrastructure protect from rising seas and, and, and larger storms and storm surges. Carbon capture um, and sequestration of carbon is obviously a hugely important part of what we need to do. Uh, unfortunately, uh, climate change is here, the effects are being felt. Um, you know, adapting is obviously important, the adaptation element um, we are focused on, but also the mitigation. Um, and so we do need to uh, draw carbon from the atmosphere. Unfortunately, the levels of carbon as we carbon dioxide, as we all know, are creating a rising uh, temperatures on our planet, and that is destroying our marine ecosystems, it's creating larger storms. And obviously, the net effect is rising sea levels, which for a low lying uh, a set of coral atolls, which we are as a nation, this becomes mission critical. Right at the forefront of the Blue Action Lab is workforce development. You know, we, we recognize that the solutions, and, and Dr. Mara spoke about this, as did the others, that, you know, that the solutions for our country, for, for our island, and for the world have to come from a place-based, um, community-driven perspective. They might be globally applied, but we have to make sure that they hear the concerns of the people in the Bahamas, the communities that will be affected, uh, not just in regards to the, the fears of climate change, but also the opportunities. You know, where do we feel as Bahamians, we have real opportunity and we can add real value. And I'll come on to that in a minute. But, you know, I, I firmly believe that, you know, we as Bahamians living in our own natural environment should be masters of that natural environment. And the blue and the green economies lend themselves 
to naturally lend themselves to the people of the Bahamas becoming the thought leaders and change makers and harnessing the opportunities that are contained within these particular new sectors of the economy. Um, circular economy is obviously hugely important. Uh, food security, both on land in the form of hydroponics, but also in the sea in the form of aquaponics. And I think we do need to distinguish between sustainable aquaculture and unsustainable aquaculture. And I think you know the world is suffering from aquaculture that is uh, conducted in a way that actually has net negative impacts on our environment and actually on the food chain that, that we all survive on. So whenever we talk about aquaculture and, and agriculture, it has to be done in a way that is uh, uh, sustainable, uh, both for the fisheries themselves, but the, the people who, who eat the seafood. Um, and I think, you know, I would just say that whatever we do within the Action Lab has a large degree of environmental stewardship. So while we do think we can expedite uh, or help companies right at the core of our value propositions, leveraging the, the, the streamlined licensing process contained within the Port Authority to allow them to come down here and operate in an expeditious manner. As I think we all know, if you've worked in the investment space, the early stage business space, the entrepreneurial space, that valley of death um, that can occur uh, between uh, implementation and commercialization is, is shortening that is the difference between a successful business and, and a failed business. So we really hope that we can expedite um, that particular uh, uh, licensing process, helping uh, companies get to the market uh, faster than they would do in other jurisdictions. Um, but we have to do it with environmental stewardship. And I would, I would just say, I'd like to commend Rochelle Newbold, who is the director of, of DEEP, who's doing a fantastic job there. And I would just say that, you know, we've been very fortunate to have uh, the backing of Minister Pintard, who gave the opening address. We can't do anything here really without uh, uh, the help of government, working with government, and they've been extremely helpful uh, in supporting us, working in partnership uh, with us, as have the Grand Bahama Port Authority, who are really the, the founding partner uh, alongside uh, uh, the other partners in the Blue Action Lab. Um, we, we are a nonprofit. Um, we, uh, but we have some very strategic relationships that we, we have now. We've, we are a strategic partner with the Atlantic Smart Ports X, uh, Blue Accelerator Network. There's about 43 ports around the world, largely in Europe, that are coming together to allow technologies that are going to provide a sustainable future and lower carbon footprint, uh, etc. Leverage the blue economy technologies that are being developed, implemented inside uh, these various ports that they would lend themselves as, as breeding grounds and test cases uh, for these particular technologies. I think being a part of that conversation is hugely important for the Bahamian technologies, but also the, the international technologies that we look to bring down here. Uh, we, we, we hope to work very closely with the World Ocean Council. We're having very interesting conversations with them. Um, we are in the process, hopefully, of signing MOUs with, with the Bahamas National Trust and the government to formalize our relationship we're very lucky to have Chris Maxey at the Island School on our board of advisors as well. Um, and more recently, we did just win uh, the Blue Climate Initiative, which was a, a, co a competition, uh, I think, that 100 countries ended up um, applying for. We were one of six winners. Um, and we were very happy to, to receive the backing of that particular initiative for, uh, for place-based community uh, uh, solutions in the face of climate change uh, focused on the blue economy. Um, you know, we, I mean, that in a nutshell, that's where we are. If you want to talk about the types of businesses that are coming down here, because I think it's important for Bahamians to understand, you know, to, to tangentialize the actual opportunities here. Um, we have a company called Coral Vita, which is already here. Some of you may have heard of them. They are growing corals 50 times faster than they grow in their natural environment. Um, so that they can be replanted back into the seas to repair our dying reefs. Um, they're using something called assisted evolution, uh, which is taking corals in the tanks, raising the temperatures, the acidification, which is actually the effect of climate change at the moment, seeing which corals survive, and then using those corals to create a more resilient strain to be planted back into the oceans so that they survive in the face of climate change. Uh, we have a company called Sail Cargo, which we're really excited about, um, who we hope 
will be starting operations here in the not too distant future. Uh, they are actually using sustainable boat building methods to build wooden large vessels that are powered by um, powered by sail and clean hydrogen and battery technology. So it's a, it's a, a clean transportation, marine transportation technology. Um, but, but perhaps more importantly is that they are looking to set up a training facility here where we can bring back the Bahamian boat building industry, an industry that we were once fantastic at, and which unfortunately has died, uh, I think, over the course of the last few decades. So reinvigorating uh, that industry, creating clean marine transportation uh, would be fantastic for us. Obviously, there's huge job opportunities within all the businesses that we're bringing here. Uh, we have agricultural businesses, aquaculture businesses. Uh, we have desalination businesses uh, as well. Um, and I look, maybe we can speak about some of these in more detail, um, but I recognize I'm probably getting near to my five minutes. So I'm going to stop there. And again, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak about what we're doing here. Uh, we look forward to working with the Bahamas Development Bank on, on funding opportunities, both for our partners, our members, and, and also for the Action Lab itself. So thank you very much. Thank you, Rupert. That was great. We'd like to move on to Nikita. Nikita, are you ready? Just sharing my screen right now. Okay, hi everyone. How are you doing? I just want to make sure I am seen. We um second, please. Sorry, so uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm joining you. My name is Eagle Ray Empress, also known as Nikita Shield Roll, and I'm joining you here today from the Eris Munker Research Center in Knowles, Cat Island. And I'm really happy to share that we actually have a cohort of our community marine scientists in training who are joining us along in real time, in person, as we are um, with you virtually as well. So I'm just trying to make sure that I can share my screen so that all um, our participants here today can also see the presentation. So just one moment, please. And um, I'm going to dive in. So we can't see your presentation. I'm about to share it. That's, uh, I'm working on it. Sorry, one second. Okay, so, well, we're going to uh, just dive into this because we don't have much time. And unfortunately, my team here, because of the share screening, I'm not able to share them both, but I just, can you confirm that you can actually see my screen? Yes, we can. We can see your presentation. Okay, fantastic. <sighs> Wonderful. It's such a pleasure to be here. I'm so excited to dive into this conversation with each of you today. I'm going to be talking about ocean genome and the magic of our beautiful ocean and what we have available to us. But before I get started, I would like to share initially with you that um, 
have you, I don't know, have you ever tried to learn a foreign language before? So on my screen, um, you'll see that there are these symbols on the right that are in yellow. And these are uh, letters in Amharic. Amharic is one of the many languages of Ethiopia. And if you've ever tried to learn a language, um, life can be a bit challenging, especially if you don't understand any of the words that people are saying. Um, and I think this is very similar to the way that we explore the ocean, where for us diving into the ocean, especially as Bahamians, this is new territory for us. Most Bahamians have never put their head underwater. And because of that, we really need to um, pause and reflect on what does establishing a blue economy look like for us that is fair and equitable? So I want to teach you this phrase in Amharic. Uh, so this first word here says katafatro. So you can say it with me, katafatro, katafatro, katafatro. Okay, this, these two symbols here, it's a connecting word, gar. So it's like what we would say with. And then the last word is mezmamat, mezmamat, katafatro gar mezmamat, which um, the English translation is harmony with nature. And so I really want us to embody this as we are literally diving into developing a brand new blue economy for ourselves as Bahamians, but also when we are talking about um, being patient with ourselves because there's a lot that we don't know, right? There's a lot that we don't understand about the ocean. And I think we have to be kind and gentle with how we literally dive into the ocean and do it in a way that everyone has equitable access. And so this is what I'm going to explore a bit today in this conversation, looking at how do we as Bahamians really develop a way of being um, in Katapatro Gar Mezmamat, being in harmony with nature as we are um, expanding our understanding of how we are showing up in Bahamians and really what is possible for us. So with that being said, when we talk about the ocean genome, when we talk about bioextractives, really we're talking about all the genetic material that comes from the ocean. And so this includes um, ecological aspects such as biodiversity and resilience. This also looks at provisioning services. So we had conversations earlier today when we talked about fisheries and then also coastal protection. So this is how we ensure that we are safe from these hurricanes that are gonna continue coming our way, so from flooding. And then there's also the commercial benefits of the genetic material, such as pharmaceuticals and cosmetics and so much that we can't even imagine, bioplastics. You know, uh, Vanessa gave a really interesting conversation about creating food. Um, all of this is dependent on, even sustainable feed for the aquaculture industry is all dependent on how we understand the animals and plants within our ocean and um, what we then decide to do with that. And so I would like to bring your attention to Climate Action SDG 13. And so I always start my conversations and I feel like every single time I talk about the Bahamas, it's always grounded in climate action. And this is specific because we, we just have to do this. This is just how we have to talk going forward. Everything is connected to climate action. Everything is connected to climate solutions. We literally have to redefine how we are solving our problems and how we're talking about some of the challenges that we have. And in, um, at the 75th celebration for the United Nations, uh, Charles Hamilton, who is uh, one of the founding members of the Cat Island Conservation Institute, addressed all the leaders of the world. And he was bringing a message not only from young Bahamians, but also from uh, young Islanders all throughout the Caribbean. And it was literally, it's do or we die. And I remember sitting in the Caribbean Youth uh, Network meeting asking, you know, my colleagues from the region, what do we want to tell the leaders of the world? And, you know, they said, 
it's do or we die. And I was like, whoa, we're going to kill them? Like, I don't, I don't think that's an appropriate response. But then I realized, oh, no, if we don't do, if the world does not do, we as Caribbean islanders will die. It's already happened. We don't want it to happen again. And so this is where bold and ambitious climate action comes in. And this is where we really get to understand what our oceans have to offer. And fundamentally, our work at the Cat Island Conservation Institute is grounded in community. It's grounded in the understanding that Bahamians from all walks of life must be long-term active participants in the co-creation of our resilient island communities. And how we engage our community matters. This also means that we have to be real as Bahamians. And I think sometimes we don't like the truth. I also sometimes, you know, the truth can be painful when you have to give yourself a good look and say, okay, I didn't show up as my best self today, or we are not showing up as our best selves as a nation. Um, and this is something that we have to honestly do if we're really thinking about developing a thriving and flourishing blue economy, because we have challenges. We do not have equitable access to education. We do not have equitable access to resources. And this impacts and will impact how we move forward. So with that being said, uh, we at the Catalan Conservation Institute are committed to bold and ambitious climate action. And this includes establishing the first community biodiversity genetics laboratory in the Bahamas. And what we're doing with this is that we are working with members in our community and learning together how to develop the skills so that we will be able to uh, literally go dive into the ocean, uh, harvest, collect, um, genetic samples, process that in a laboratory here in Cat Island, and let this become the basis of us as Bahamians having ownership of our blue economy, of understanding what it is that we have. And I think this is a really, really important point. Um, how we see the world impacts how and why we do research and who has access to that information. And unfortunately for us as Bahamians, and this is uh, can be said for most of the global south is that we have not had the same access to information to resources to research to science this is because of our history you know we have to be brutally honest education is not where it needs to be in the bahamas and we need to work diligently to get it there but we have to be unapologetic about where it is that we want to go and we have to be lovingly and brutally honest that it's not where it needs to be at the moment so with that being said, I really want to call your attention to the fact that 98% of patents that are um, being cited right now from marine genes are all affiliated with international um, and global north institutions. Uh, the top 10 countries, um, of course, are all from the global north. The top three of them are the United States, the UK, and Germany. And there is increasing inequity in biodiscovery and innovation. And this impacts the overall health of our ocean. This impacts ourselves as individuals who live in an ocean nation. And we need to learn how we can counter this. Okay. So um, what I would like to take a minute to do is just shine a light on the value of understanding our biodiversity. Because marine biodiversity is, and protecting our biodiversity, understanding our biodiversity is so much more than just ensuring that we can maybe benefit from the pharmaceutical drug that was created from um, something found in our waters. And I wanna be very clear, the COVID vaccine right now, one of the enzymes being used to, to help uh, combat the spread of COVID-19 came from a hydrothermal vent in the deep the depths of the oceans. We right now know more about the surface of the moon than we know about the genetic biodiversity of our oceans. Um, and then as we are able to improve our ability to collect data about our biodiversity, to really understand what we have, this will be the driver and the engine for a flourishing um, blue economy for us, because this will mean that we will have highly skilled researchers. We will be able to retain Bahamians as opposed to having them leave the country, ensuring that they come back and work with us. We have so much talent, but right now we're not able to adequately engage them. 
Additionally, um, you know, as we develop our access to quality equipment, sophisticated equipment, and then also just improve general public participation and understanding of science and understanding of this process, all of this is going to boost our capacity, not just for the Bahamas, but for the region to really be able to thrive and to be able to have a flourishing, sustainable blue economy. And at the heart of any blue economy conversations, we have to center uh, a healthy ocean, a safe ocean, an inclusive ocean. So um, thinking about the Bahamas, thinking about the next de decade, what should be some of our national priorities for our blue economy, specifically for moving into this bio-extractive industry? And so one, research, research, research. If you do not know what you have, you do not have skin in the game. And I want to really um, highlight a point. The international com community right now isn't just talking about exploring what's in their exclusive economic zone. They are right now, you know, neck and neck trying to figure out how they're going to explore, how they're going to understand what the entire ocean has to offer. You know, we are, because of our lack of and our historic lack of uh, skills and capacity in country, um, we at our region are at a disadvantage for this. And so if we are serious about the blue economy being something that as a nation we are moving towards, these priorities, we cannot escape them. And so the question is, how do we improve our research capacity? How do we improve our access to technology? How do, we, how do we understand and increase our access to data, equitable collaboration within and throughout the region, and also with international partners, but this then requires us to um, really improve our capacity and what we bring to the table so that we can be working at, from a more equitable position. And I think this often means that we have to we have to set the standards higher. And I do, I celebrate the bold action by DEPP where they set, you know, they, they set a really high bar when it comes to doing research in the Bahamas and it comes to the, the permitting process. And so now though, what we, I think as Bahamians, we're really looking at how do we, how do we take advantage of the opportunities presented to us in the ocean? We have to um, have and develop meaningful relationships between the government of the Bahamas, between the private sector and our civil society. This is the only way that our blue economy is going to, to flourish. And at the end of the day, it's finance. If there's no money, we're not going anywhere. Um, and so, you know, your priorities are always determined by where you place your money. And I know budgets are coming up for the government of the Bahamas. Um, we really need to, we need to have a national research budget, period. You know, governments are supposed to, the recommendation from UNESCO is 2% of your GDP should be invested towards science, technology, and innovation. You know, we really need to um, level up with how we are understanding our oceans so that we are not disadvantaged when it comes to um, taking advantage of all that the knowledge has to offer. And so this is a proposed action plan for how do we go about uh, really thriving and developing this flourishing blue economy over this next decade. Well, first, we need to build our knowledge base of the ocean genome. And this means we got money needs to be invested into understanding um, the, the different taxons, different species that we have, and maintaining regular assessments of this. Additionally, we have to uh, protect the marine genetic diversity that we have, we have to understand it and we have to develop long-term spatiotemporal ways of assessing what we have. And this really means upholding our international commitments, but then also protecting our biodiversity hotspots. And then, and only then, once we know what we have, are we really going to be in a position to then transition from research into commercialization? And at the heart of our commercialization of our blue economy, it needs to be centered. Ocean conservation has to be at the heart of that. Because at the end of the day, if we do not have the resources, all the ideas about creating the, the beautiful um, pharmaceuticals or uh, leather from the fish or anything else is not going to happen unless um, we can ensure that those resources are there and that those resources are also part of protecting to ensure that we 
can continue to have safe and beautiful lives on these islands. And at the, the last point is really about how do we ensure that we have equity in how we move forward in our genomic research and the, this commercialization process. Understanding that most Bahamians, especially if you're in the room with me today and here in Cat Island, you've just been thrown into you know, a day of overwhelming information on the ocean that you've probably never even heard about before. And I wanna say that's okay, right? We don't have to know everything. Just like you're learning a language, right? So we're gonna take it one word at a time, one wave at a time, but we have to be intentional about ensuring that there's skills transfer, that there's access to the technology and that there are equitable collaboration specifically with our local communities because it's gonna be our local communities throughout the Bahamas that are going to enable us to really tap into the blue economy. And I love that uh, Kirk mentioned the Knowledge Nation because I am the biggest fan of a Knowledge Nation. I believe that the Bahamas is a Knowledge Nation and we are not an oil nation. And I really want to emphasize this unapologetically that if we are having conversations about developing a bioeconomy, and when we talk about bioeconomy, I'm talking about how we are producing renewable biological resources and whether it's generating food, feed, uh, bio-based products. This has to happen in a sustainable way. And there's nothing about developing an oil industry that is benefiting our development of a sustainable blue economy. And so, yeah, not mincing my words on that. So we are a knowledge nation. I think there's so much more potential there for us as a nation um, to really explore how understanding our oceans, ocean observations will be a benefit to us. And this is where a climate resilient Bahamas requires evidence-based adaptive management and education for climate solutions. And this is exactly what we're doing here in Cat Island. Uh, I fundamentally believe that research skills are a tool for climate solutions and social justice and that every single Bahamian needs to develop these research skills. And so we're working and we're developing models for how we can work with both our high school students as pictured here, but then also with our community members to work as co-researchers. So the people that you're seeing in this picture right now on my screen are the same people that I'm looking at in front that I'm presenting to. And we are uh, certifying the first cohort of uh, community marine scientists. This is a brand new trade, but this is a trade that once our Cat Island team is certified, we will now have island capacity to go out and begin understanding the oceans off of Cat Island, what we have, what the state is, so that we can start to, one step at a time, one word at a time, one wave at a time, move towards building a blue economy that is beneficial to all Bahamians. And at the end of the day, we have to close the policy science society feedback loop. And at the heart of this, we need the science, we need our biodiversity genetics. We have to understand where we are, but it's not good enough for just the scientists to understand that we need every single Bahamian to be part of this process. And so this is what we're envisioning with the development of this biodiversity genetics laboratory here in Cat Island, is that our Cat Island community members, whether you're a waitress or you're a hotelier or you're a fisher, you will have the skills to be able to work and be part of this discovery of what we have as the and as Bahamians in our country, and then how we can ensure that the right policy is being put into place, that we can refine the policy that currently exists so that it's beneficial for all. And so with that being said, I'm going to bring us back to the final word that we learned uh, in the beginning, katafatro gar mezmamat. One more time, say it with me, katafatro gar mezmamat. That is a mark for harmony with nature. And I believe this as Bahamians really should be our vision and our goal. How do we learn to live in harmony with our ocean, with the nature that surrounds us? And I believe there are new circular economic models that we can explore. For example, I'm imagining a, a Bahamas where we have research vessels that are luxury boats that maybe serve as both a fishing 
home port, um, a vessel where we can go out to sort of like how the poachers have the motherships, you know, but we have our, our luxury vessel. And then the beginning of the day, you've got the fishers go out and do their fishing, maybe on the Kisal banks. And then the scientists go out and do their, their studies. And then you have tourists who maybe go and spend a day diving or doing whatever, or following around the community scientists, because it's so cool. People love learning, especially when it's hands-on. Um, and then all this information that we gather will help to lead into whatever the, the bioeconomy, um, whatever we want to make it. But at the end of the day, Bahamians have to have ownership of, of this industry. And this requires us to, and the government of the Bahamas, private sector, we have to invest in our people, our human capital, because it will only be through our human capital that we are going to be able to develop a flourishing blue economy and uh, reap the benefits of all the bioextractives that there are there for us. Thank you. Thank you, Nikita. That was a very informative presentation. I'm sure your passion was felt all throughout the audience. So thank you again. We'd like to move into our discussion session. So my first question is for Dr. Kirk. The question is, how do we connect biosecurity with conservation and sustainable livelihoods? I thank you very much. Um, page. The connection we see with the Center for Biosecurity Studies, we've defined actually or redefined biosecurity as the science and practice of safeguarding lives and livelihoods. And this is really done through the reduction of systematic vulnerabilities to biological ecosystems. And so at the heart of biosecurity for us at the center is how do we then um, try to reduce these vulnerabilities that are present within the Caribbean. Uh, we would have heard uh, the many presentations done in terms of aquaculture in the first session, um, aquaponics and also aquaculture. Um, there is also the risk of when you're doing farming of, of, sea, uh, of seafood and um, shellfish that you also have to ensure that the food safety isn't compromised, especially when you're doing large farmed um, projects. And so this is uh, a, a essential, um, essential point. Also, one of the major initiatives that we have ongoing at the center is the Caribbean Wildlife Initiative. And wildlife includes not only terrestrial, but also um, aquatic and also maritime uh, wildlife as well. And so within the Caribbean, we recognize that there is uh, unfortunate activity of illegal wildlife trade and I think in terms of conservation, this is a real, real issue that we have to be cognizant of because what we fail to understand within the Caribbean is the true value of our biodiversity. And until we can actually change the perspective that we currently hold of biodiversity, then this type of, this type of activity will continue to occur. And also we will also miss a lot of opportunities to actually derive um, true and, and sustainable value from the biodiversity within um, the Caribbean. So it's going to be important that we do raise the level of awareness um, to these types of activities and to also the intrinsic value of the biodiversity that we have within the Caribbean. So that's where I think um, biodiversity, well, biosecurity and um, conservation and livelihoods are, are um, included. Great, thank you. And before we jump into the next question, I think it's important to highlight Vanessa's comment in the chat. She says that she wants to re-emphasize Nikita's words and stress how important science and innovation are for the blue economy. We sit on the precipice of something big. Collaboration is a priority. There has always been a blue economy in the Bahamas. Applying science and innovation to that will diversify our economy. If we think COVID negatively impacted, impacted our way of life with new norms, climate change, will certainly change the way we live, our culture. And the bike supports that comment. We do agree. So thank you again for that, Nikita and Dr. Kirk. So our next question is for Rupert. Global partnership is important for bringing new models, modes of thinking, and best practice to the Bahamian ecosystem. What makes the Bahamas uniquely attractive for global investment? And how can Bahamians participate? Uh, thank you, Paige. Um, well, 
obviously we've spoken very much about our, our natural resources um, and and I think you know we can't overlook the fact that we have a, a significant EEZ, we have a very diverse marine ecosystem and coastal ecosystems with diverse flora and fauna. Um, and I think that you know if we're looking to test technologies or we're looking to grow aquaculture, we're looking to um, develop the restoration economy, those are particularly important. I mean the Bahamas you know, we sit 60 miles in Grand Bahama off the largest economy in the world. So, you know, we're a natural gateway um, to that market as well. We, uh, we're obviously a tax light jurisdiction, which has its benefits for, for investors, um, which I think we can't overlook. Obviously, I spoke about the benefits of operating inside the port area, um, sort of streamlined licensing uh, process that we have here, access to very much underutilized um, infrastructure at affordable levels, which is very hard to access around the world. So I think those are critical pieces for, for investors and for companies looking to build value. How do, I mean, how do Bahamians get involved? Well, the Action Lab is set up to facilitate, um, you know, equitable uh, and diverse involvement um, in this particular blue economy. So, you know, we're looking to place people inside our own business, but also inside the businesses that come down here. They're looking to employ Bahamians um, in those particular entities. I think, you know, the point just raised about science and education is also an extremely important one. And Nikita made a very good point. You know, we, the precursor to innovation and for Bahamians being able to develop our own businesses and technologies is a deep understanding of the problem. And I think there's a real opportunity here for people to be educators in the space. Um, you know, people like Nikita is doing a fantastic job and other NGOs, you know, that their impact, it, it, you know, is, is exponential. Um, but also in the science space, I think there's a great opportunity here for us to become masters of our own natural environment, understand it better than anyone else. Um, I think that's hugely important. I think when we look at um, the conservation piece as well, I think within the blue economy, you know, whether it's uh, actually involved in the fisheries themselves or the conservation of our marine environments, I think those are also really important elements um, to Bahamian participation in this ecosystem that is the blue economy. Thank you. So moving forward, I'd just like to remind everyone of the two minute time limit on our question responses. So coming in from our Facebook live stream, we have another question. In addition to concerns about environmental sewage, climate change, or global warming affecting our sensitive biodiversity, how does oil drilling impact or benefit the blue or green economy? That's free for anyone to answer. Um, well, I, 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 I tend to look at our natural environment in the Bahamas as our greatest asset. Um, you know, we, our tourism is built around our pristine beaches and our beautiful reefs. Um, you know, we, we would not have a blue economy without the preservation of those marine ecosystems. And so I think, you know, there's always this balance, isn't there, between economic progress and prosperity for Bahamians, which, as we all know, is important, certainly you know, after a pandemic, when our economy is being destroyed, and making sure that we make the right long-term decisions that, you know, provide long-term sustainability and equitable development for Bahamians. And I think drilling is a very sensitive subject. I think there is a real environmental risk. And I think that is, while it might solve issues in the short term, I think it creates real long-term sustainable issues for the economies that we're speaking about, the blue and green economies, um, uh, but also our tourism sector. Um, you know, oil spills would be catastrophic for us and they take many, many years to, to, um, to rectify those issues. So I would, I would be wary uh, of oil drilling. Thank you very much. Our next question comes from Mr. Godfrey Rule in our question and answer box. His question to all panelists is, how do we effectively begin that journey of acquiring knowledge, given the challenges of the lack of finances and perhaps of political will here in the Bahamas? Also, he has an additional question. Is there an, is there an existing list of Bahamian marine scientists, both at home and internationally, that we can use as perhaps a go-to list? 
I'll jump in on that one. Um, so your first question, yes, you know what's so beautiful and I love the fact that our pool of Bahamian scientists are growing by the day. And this is why it's so critical that we invite people to come home, that we also want Bahamians to be leading the research, right? So often because of the lack of resources and finances, we are adjacent to or in support of, but there's no one who's going to really be able to understand our country, our resources of our country, and how we can creatively tie those resources into um, economic innovation like Bahamians. And this is why bringing Bahamians from all walks of life together is going to be critical in how we move forward and address our, um, and build a blue economy. To the first question, I think really, we, how we speak about um, moving forward as a nation, specifically about research, it's the question has to be, how do we fund it? Where do we find the funding? Who's going to fund it? We are, and the reason why we're so challenged right now is that as a country, we are considered a high income uh, nation. And with this high income nation categorization, this limits our access to grant funding that organizations like myself and many other environmental organizations and research organizations struggle to, to tap into. Additionally, as you know, a lot of the global North nations have, you know, the United States has the National Science Research Foundation. Like there are pools of money and pockets of money set aside to support research, to drive innovation. Uh, and so national priority is where do we find the money? Because we can find money, let's be real. We find money all the time. We just need to care enough. And this is something where I, I really want to be explicitly clear. We have a window and with this window, we can transform the lives of every single Bahamian. You know, really moving out of this mindset of jobs into how do we find these passion projects that are sustaining our lifestyles, you know, that allow us to really move out of crisis mode and move like thinking about Maslow's hierarchies of needs and moving up that hierarchy into a more of a space of self-actualization. So the question is how, I think we've got the bank here with us who's facilitating this conversation. And so uh, I think all of us have to be very intentional about going to the bank, having real conversations about what our real costs are. The ocean is expensive. And this is often why people don't understand what it takes to do this work. And because it's new, there's a lot of hesitance. You know, I had to work for over a year to get $20,000 to start the Community Marine Scientist Training Project. It shouldn't be that way because, you know, we need Bahamians to have the skills, but we have to now figure out how can we make it easier for the scientists, for people who have capacity, the organizations to access that funding. And so this is where I'm really excited to work with the bank and for all of us to have these conversations with the bank. Paige, I've just um, seen a message from Thomas Butler, which I'd quickly like to, to answer, if that's possible, just about um, you know, equitable development and not just jobs, but entrepreneurial opportunities, which uh, if I didn't clarify, I'd just like to quickly, because he's absolutely right. Um, I mean, it's not just about jobs. It is really about creating a future of Bahamian entrepreneurs. And, and that is definitely a goal of the Action Lab. That is exactly where we want to get to. Um, this is not just about bringing foreign technologies here. It's, it's about developing Bahamian businesses, technologies, entrepreneurs right at the forefront. We recognize that not all of those technologies that we need today to build that resilient future and climate change is happening quickly. So we do need to embed, you know, the technologies that are already developed as quickly as possible and that's really why the Action Lab is set up. So we will be bringing in foreign technologies if we can, um, because they are, you know, that it's, it's going to be a global solution, uh, not just a Bahamian one to, uh, you know, to, to create a sustainable, equitable and resilient future for the Bahamas. But I think it's a very good point that Mr. Butler makes, and he's absolutely right. And I would also just like to add to Nikita as well. But yes, that funding is one of the major um, pitfalls or hurdles that we have in terms of reaching the, the zenith of the uh, potential that exists in the blue economy. But there are some emerging uh, funding opportunities specifically within the climate change agenda. And I think that that is an area that we can explore. We are currently exploring it here at CBS and there are some very lucrative 
lucrative um, options. And uh, we can discuss it a bit more, Nikita, if you would like. Um, but yes, there are, and it's specifically for the Caribbean as well. So um, yes, I do take your point and support you fully there as well. Thank you all for your feedback on that. I have another question for Nikita. Can you explain the need for holistic thinking in order for Bohemian people to benefit from the circular economy and our biodiverse region? Beautiful, thank you for that. So I love, you know, okay. We are our body. We are in our body, but you are not your body, right? You have a mind, your mind thinks, but at the end of the day, you aren't your mind. So I share this illustration to articulate how our very existence, as I show up as Eagle Ray, Empress, or Nikita, there's all these components to me that make my whole. And we need to move forward with this understanding that as we are learning about our country, as we're learning about our ocean, as we're learning to live in harmony with nature, Katapatro, Gar Mesmamat, we need to give ourselves permission to feel uncomfortable because we have been boxed into a way of operating as a nation that's been very siloed, but this is not gonna allow us to move forward. And so there has to be more cross communication between everyone from at the, our ministerial level, right down to our communities. We all have to understand the problem. We have to understand how I, as an individual living here on Cat Island is contributing to both uh, solution and challenges in this bigger system. And I think this is why I always talk about perspective. I always talk about where we are, you know, as of the Bahamas, there's 400,000 of us, maybe, right? I always like to draw the analogy between the population of the Miami-Dade public school system and the population of the, the, the Bahamas. The difference is about 20 to 30,000 people like really insignificant. And so this is where I think we have this incredible opportunity to get specific, to really identify what are the needs, what are the barriers to preventing people from showing up as their best selves, being able to participate in conversations or even to talk about the ocean, right? There are barriers that we have not taken the time to address. And a big factor of that is education and it's also well-being and quality of life, you know, and, and we have to brutally and we have to be honest, we have to be very, very honest and give a, a, a true audit of how we are operating as a country, where are the needs that we really need to address and how do we ensure that that's equitably, um, that those needs are addressed even if it's untraditional. Because at this point in time, we don't have time to be nitpicking on, well, someone needs access to clean water, but we can't, you know, like, no, everyone needs to have access to clean water. You want to have a sustainable blue economy. People need to be able to drink clean water. People need potable water. People in our country do not have potable water, right? So these are the underlying SDGs that we need to all be intentional about how we address so that we can achieve our end goal. Because if you're starving, you're not going to sit in my community marine scientist class to learn about biodiversity because your head's not going to be there. And that's just the reality. So we need to make sure that people are in that space so they can equitably participate. And the same thing goes for how we negotiate our development deals. We need to be in positions of power to have these conversations of how about how we're developing our country. Understood, thank you. So in the chat box, we had a comment from Ms. Janet Johnson, the Executive Director and CEO of the Tourism Development Corporation. We'd like to invite Ms. Johnson to elaborate more on her comment, please. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, and it's good to be here. And I've thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed the presentations today. Um, and I'm very excited about the fact that uh, we have all of this um, intellectual uh, property here at the Bahamas. I'm, I'm, I'm just so very excited. But I wanted to share with you the opportunity of the World's Fair, uh, the Expo 2020 Dubai, which is taking place in Dubai in October of 2021. 
Um, it was obviously delayed because of the pandemic um, and it will take place from October, 2021 to March, 2022, so six months. Um, the Bahamas, we, we, have, we have a core team um, that's been working on this project for the past four years and um, all volunteers and drawn from the private and public sector. And we have now uh, a pavilion that is 7,500 square feet, two stories, um, the ground floor to exhibit what we are do doing to mitigate against um, the ravages of climate change. Uh, we are positioned in the uh, sustainability quadrant. There are three sub themes to the, to the um, expo, opportunity, mobility, and sustainability. And we are in the sustainability quadrant. So we have uh, 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 put together a, an, a, a very compelling exhibit um, and uh, we're very, very proud of it. And we're inviting um, uh, businesses, uh, scientists, uh, those who are looking for grants, uh, the bank to, to come to the, to the uh, exhibit um, or to, to register through our B2B app and to be able to do business in Dubai and to, 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 to um, look for, for investors. Uh, Nikita talked about being behind uh, uh, grants through, uh, you know, if the bank were to come and we were, to a were able to create the opportunities for the bank to meet with potential investors to speak about these um, opportunities uh, for investment, uh, there could be some take up on that. And so I wanna put it out there. Um, I, through the bank, you can get my um, telephone number, my email address, and I'm happy to share uh, with you all of uh, that the, the, the we have um, available for Bahamians to come and be a part of this. This is the, this is the World's Fair. It takes place every four years. It's in Dubai and the theme is connecting minds and creating the future. Um, they're all about the youth. They're all about wanting to, to, to see a better world and uh, to generate innovations. Don't forget, uh, Dubai recently uh, went to Mars. Um, so they're very innovative. They started out as uh, a, sh a fishing village, um, not unlike the Bahamas. Um, they're, they're just as old as we are. I think they're a year um, younger than we are in terms of independence. Um, they're part of the United Emirates, of which there are seven, and Dubai is one of the wealthier of the, of, of the Emirates, along with the capital of Abu Dhabi. So I encourage you to, to inquire about Expo 2020 Dubai and the Bahamas Pavilion in this endeavor. And I thank you for listening. Thank you, Ms. Johnson, for that. Seems like a very exciting opportunity. Since we are thinking on the world scale, Dr. Kirk, could you elaborate more on what are the greatest opportunities within the biodiverse space right now? And where do you see the region moving within the next few years? Uh, thank you, uh, Paige. I think the, the opportunity lies within um, what we currently have. Uh, one of the initiatives we have at the CBS, the Center for Biosecurity Studies, is an initiative called Waste Not, Want Not. And what this is seeking to do is to really highlight the bioeconomy, of which I think the blue economy is part of, um, but you also have the green economy as well. And how we can utilize what we currently have that we are underutilizing. And I think our biodiversity is perhaps the richest of which you can find geographically within one geographic um, region. We are predominantly referred to as small island developing states, but in the actuality, we are really large ocean states because when you look at our ter territorial um, distribution, as high as 80% of our territory is really composed of oceans, whereas you know, a very small proportion is really land-based. 
but often our perspective is usually confined to what we are actually you know living on but actually the ocean represents a really uncharted space and i think that trying to understand first what is there how we can conserve it because we can't conserve what we don't know and if you undervalue something you're not going to protect it it is almost like if you have a fiat punto or you have a bmw when you drive it the the fiat on the road you're going to drive it normally you know you may drop in a pothole or two but if you're driving your new brand new bmw you're going to take extreme care of where you drive how fast you drive where you're going and even your braking distance so to change the, the the perspective is to change the way how we value our biodiversity that i think is going to be critical to to really tapping into all of these colored economies like the blue economy and the green economy and that is going to be critical to 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 really derive the the economic value because when people understand the economic value of something then they treat it differently it is just the reality of it and um to do that will take awareness it will take advocacy on many different levels at the community level like what Nikita is doing also at the business level like what Rupert is doing as well and so i think a holistic um approach is what is needed the way we view biosecurity is very multidisciplinary so it calls on a pulse from different sectors you you talk about the environmental management space is also border security because even if we do develop some of these uh solutions and um these entrepreneurship ideas for, such as pearl uh culture we still also have to within that development also holistically develop for instance with the, the bohemian um biosecurity uh network and also structure for instance with your border security so they will also have to be sensitized also you the judiciary and also the the legal end of it because then you can have people who will try to also mimic and also you know try to steal intellectual property um claiming that is coming from the bahamas so it's a holistic view and approach you have to in terms of developing this economy is not only to produce the product but the whole um equal system um of generating the blue economy that also I have to look at so this would be judges this would be lawyers this would be police this would be um immigration officers um those that are coast guard so the entire entire so that's how we view by security and we find that that is more holistic initially people are a bit uh, apprehensive because they don't quite see how they fit in the picture but when you actually go through it bit by bit and step by step then they understand that the world exists as we exist in our society when you go to the supermarket you will meet people from all walks of life and that is how we view by security because that is how we um that's how we interact and that's how we we actually live Clearly understood. Thank you for that our explanation. We have one final comment from Nikita. I'll give you the floor. Thank you. I just um Kirk, I loved your comments there and I really want to reiterate. I love how you talk about the blue economy as an ecosystem. That's the perfect word because I think this is where we may be challenged as a nation is that we are not able to see the whole ecosystem. We don't yet understand how all these components interact and and especially understanding and ensuring that we have the legal expertise in country who really understand the biodiversity and and can can communicate that um this is going to be critical in the same respect you know this is something that i'm really working on is i'm trying to understand and really develop my relationships literally fall in love with money and numbers and i think this is a challenge that a lot of us in the bahamas um are faced with especially those of us in the civil society i'm so tired of hearing civil society organizations talk about how we are unable to meet our budgets and so this means that we don't understand numbers well enough and so these strategic partnerships and really understanding how do we not only bring our different pieces our superpowers that our different organizations and entities are are working on and how do we create this um an ecosystem or really define who takes up what role in the ecosystem of our blue economy and how do we effectively work together um and so 
with that being said, I just, I want to encourage all of us. The only way that we are going to be able to develop a flourishing blue economy is that if we are honest with where we're challenged and we get support. Um, and so I think we, I just want to encourage all of us to reflect on where do we need help? Who do we identify? Who has the skill set to help us so we can really start to actualize these visions and ensure that it's accessible to all Bahamians? Thank you. Thank you so much. And I'd like to extend thank you to all of you for your expertise and your time today. This was a commitment that we honestly appreciate. And I want to say thank you too to our attentive audience. You've been very interactive. And I think this session was very beneficial to all of us here. And I look forward to what comes out of it. So I just want to say thank you again. And I'll hand it back over to Sumeya. Thank you all. Thanks, Paige. Um, I'd like to once again extend a thank you to everybody who's been involved so far. Um, we are going to take a short intermissive break for about half an hour and then come back for our maritime industry and energy session. Um, so we hope that you'll stay tuned and join us after the break. Um, the chat is open. So if people want to stay on and talk amongst themselves, they are welcome to do so. Um, there's a lot been a lot of questions about whether or not the presentations are going to be shared um, or where the video is going to be hosted. Because the video is recorded live on our Facebook, it will be available. And we're also working to create sort of a knowledge repository coming out of this, um, these presentations that will be available on our website. So once again, thank you. And we hope to see you back after the break at one o'clock. <laughs>